Welcome back to another episode of my favorite three designs. And today's special brand, special mark, is Porsche. If we look at Porsche, we all seem to recognize, we all think of immediately the iconic 911 model. But actually, Porsche has something for everyone. We know that Porsche has been very successful throughout the years of racing. It's won everything from Formula One, uh, Le Mans, Daytona, Nürburgring, GT racing, rally racing, you name it, they've done it and they've done it successfully. The first car I'm going to speak about is the 1953 550 Spider. Now, this is one of the cars that is about as classic and as iconic as it gets. It was inspired by the Porsche 356, except it didn't have the hard top, it came without the roof. And it was Porsche's first interpretation of a race car. What it did was cause Porsche to rethink the layout of the car, the basic package where the engine typically, like on the Beetle, was behind the rear axle and that created a certain size of vehicle, certain proportion to the vehicle. But Porsche rethought it, and they decided that for racing purposes, it was better to get the engine in front, the gearbox, transaxle, everything in front of the rear wheels. This killed the two seats in the back. Who cares? Nobody complained about it. It became a pure two-seater. So this is the car that James Dean died in. He gave up his 356 to purchase the 550 Spider. It's called the Little Bastard, or Little Bastard actually. Uh, and he had a terrible accident. But apart from that, the car has been treasured many, many years after that as one of the best Porsches ever built. Styling wise, engineering wise, it really set the trend for all future Porsches. Now having gotten rid of that sort of uninteresting sort of mechanical stuff, let's talk about why this car has achieved what I would call classic, eternal, iconic beauty. And it's down to a few things. First of all, this car, as most iconic cars, is beautiful from any angle that you choose to look at it from. It's got a very low slung stance, and I think it kind of fools the eye, because when I'm looking at it here, it does appear to be wider, and it does appear to be longer than it actually is. Why is it positive to have a car that looks like it's bigger than it actually is? Well, it creates presence, obviously, but in a road car, a race car, the more smaller you can achieve the footprint, the more nimble it's gonna be. So by dropping the hood so quickly forward and the tailgate so quickly rearwards, what we're creating is almost a very symmetrical design. It looks very balanced on the wheels. We tend these days to sort of push the emphasis either to the front or towards the back. But the beauty of this little car is that it has it actually centered over the wheels. And like I said, kind of a left, right, front, back, mirrored approach, which gives it a, a sense of being planted on the road. It works very well. There are lots of intricate details on the car, on, especially on the exterior. We've got very, very smooth lines that are sparsely interrupted, I'd say, by the body gaps, the very few body gaps that it has. When you see the car complete with the passenger tonneau cover, then it almost looks like a bar of soap. I mean, you couldn't get anything closer to look like a bar of soap in the industrial world. And another cool fact is if you actually take the 550 Spider and turn it upside down without the roof, it kind of resembles what we call the bathtub look. It has that very distinguishing uh, symmetrical feel to it. And it's oftentimes referred to the 356, the, the 550 as sort of the the iconic bathtub shape that Porsche was following back then. Now the next car I want to speak about is very significant for Porsche. Now this was the 904. Carrera GTS, and it was probably one of the most innovative cars of its era. So this car was built out of fiberglass for a lot of good reasons. It brought in a whole new concept that was very beneficial for racing. It didn't rust, it was very lightweight, and it was one of the most purest, most beautiful Porsches of them all. It was tiny, it was light, it was efficient, and it was absolutely, I think, 
a pure interpretation of Porsche's bloodline, of the racing bloodline. The beauty of this car is that I think they put a lot of emphasis on making it look like a road car more than a race car. And I think that was appreciated by a lot of people who actually were in the position to, to purchase this car. They wanted something that they could actually use on the road. So they only built 106 of these cars. They had to do a minimum of 100, but they definitely could have sold a lot more of this car simply for the beauty of it. So like most of the other Porsches of that era, the 904 was what we call a relatively straightforward design. The, the plastic or the fiberglass body featured a lot of very flowing lines. This translated obviously into very muscular fenders, uh, somewhat bulbous roof, which was very good also for the aerodynamics. It had a very, very short wheelbase and a very narrow width but it did give it that very, very distinctive, unique appearance. So the fact that chopped fiberglass had to be sprayed into each mold, and that meant there was a little bit of variation in how much fiberglass hit where, meant that each car was very unique, very individual in terms of weight. So when we're speaking about this imperfection, you don't want imperfection, obviously, in the mechanical side, but you do kind of appreciate it as being unique and a one-off if it's done on the design side. Now, imperfection doesn't mean doing something wrong. It just means that there's a bit of variation in terms of each version. And you feel much like a painting that's just being painted for you, that you have something of a one-of-one -one approach. So that I think is very special about this vehicle also. And that gives you a pride of ownership. I think that's very special. And now the third Porsche that I really love the design of, it's really interesting. And this is the Porsche 928. Now this one is really interesting because it was supposed to kill off, not kill off, but replace the 911. Everybody had big hopes within the company thinking that this combination of the best of the best of Porsche would result in a car that would become just as iconic as the 911 had become. And the 911, let's face it, was becoming a little bit long in the tooth by that period. So this car had a big, big job to do, big boots to fill. Now what happened was when they presented it in 1977 at the Geneva Motor Show, the Porsche purists were really upset. I mean, it was like, when you say it's a successor to the 911, and then this is actually a grand tour, it's less of a sports car, and to ruffle the feathers of the Porsche purists, they put the engine in the front. Now they didn't do it to ruffle the feathers, but Porsche purists, like I said, were upset about that. When they designed the 928, they wanted to focus especially on what we call a lightweight construction. Now lightweight construction means making the car overall as light as possible. That can include designing the doors as light as possible, the fenders, the, the hood, the bonnet. And so what they did was they made those parts out of alloy, aluminum, instead of steel, which was the method they typically used. And they used plastic bumpers on the car. So these were actually a design decision that was able to integrate the, the bumpers into the vehicle, which made it look very, very one formish. A very distinctive feature on this car that I really liked was that it had these pop-up visible headlamps and they were integrated into the fenders. The, the rounded fastback on this car was very, very special. It was very unique. Typically you would need spoilers and added on features to keep it glued to the ground, but it was designed for purpose. It was designed to be justifiable for the speed that it could achieve. And that, in that sense, it didn't need anything more. Of course, later versions, they started adding on spoilers as the hor horsepower went up, the performance of the vehicle went up. They needed to add aero features to the vehicle. This car, almost a corpulent, sort of heavyish looking, at least, vehicle, was designed by a very interesting designer. He's from Latvia, his name was Tony Lapine. And he had previously come from General Motors, which mean he had this kind of mentality from the American car industry. He was involved on the 63 Corvette Stingray that we all know about, the split window. And I think you can see a little bit of the Corvette 63 split window profile in this vehicle. If you look at the two, there's obvious that there's an obvious resemblance to the two. Now, if you look at the AMC Pacer, 
next to the 928, you're going to see a resemblance. I know the AMC Pacer came before. It kind of looks like an overinflated 928, whereas the 928 looks like a squashed AMC Pacer. Something heavy sat on top of the AMC Pacer, resulted in the look of the 928. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but definitely there seems to be a re resemblance to both of them. And of course, a lot of Porsche purists can say that the 928 is not what we would call an authentic Porsche, a real Porsche. But for me, I think they're wrong. I think this car definitely is a confirmation of Porsche's understanding of fundamental beauty and purity. And so with that, we're gonna wrap up this episode of my three favorite Porsche designs. I think these three cars all signify a certain type of different beauty that we can all stand back today and look at and judge them to be iconic designs from Porsche. So let me know in the comments below what are your three favorite Porsche designs. I look forward to reading them and thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.